Yes, um, I'm Susan. Uh, actually, I work at Heritage Leiden and Region, uh, Erfgoed Leiden and Omstreken in Dutch. Um, so we call it ELO. Um, I'm a project manager of education, and as we don't have any outreach officer, I do outreach as well uh, for as, uh, as much as I can do. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about using 18th century judicial archives in uh, education with 14-year-old students. Um, well, let's just uh, have a look at a short film. Okay, and then click next to it. Wrong. Wat heeft u gedaan op 21 december 1751? Ik heb mijltjes gestoken. U weet dat hier een hele zware straf tegenover staat. U zou me ophangen. Nee! Dat dacht ik wel even. Stelen is in deze tijd zwaar verboden en daarmee uit. Well, yes, um, I hope after the end of, uh, at, the, at the end of my presentation, you will understand why I was, why I was so extremely happy with this result. <laughs> um, well, I'll um, get you through uh, a short introduction of Heritage Leiden, because I don't think you know anything about it. Uh, I'll tell you something about education at Heritage Leiden and uh, our uh, starting point. Um, and then, because I don't assume you know anything about history at secondary schools in the Netherlands, I'll tell something about that, um, going on to uh, the tension between narrative and competence in history education. Um, then I will go to the judicial archives and the allure of, uh, of them. Uh, tell you something about previous projects I tried using the judicial archives because I really like them. And I will end uh, by telling something about CSI Leiden, my uh, latest project. So, uh, Heritage Leiden region. Um, I have some cards. Uh, we actually exist since 2013. So we're a very, a very young institution. Um, we are the regional archives, and we were merged with uh, monuments and archaeology of the municipality of Leiden. And Leiden is a city in the Netherlands, about 40 kilometers from Amsterdam, um, uh, with about 120,000 inhabitants. So these are our two buildings, because I almost forgot, we all, always, uh, we, we also have a windmill museum. That's very Dutch. <laughs> I sometimes forget about it, but we all also have windmill museum, and I do education for, for that as well. Um, well, as you see, I um, put on the Dutch word erfgoed, and literally, it means heritage. But I think I, I've read a lot on heritage, and uh, especially David Lorenthal. Um, he uh, says heritage has to do with a community identity and narrative and um, having uh, the, same, the same stories to share. Um, and um, we really would like to do that at Heritage Leiden, but I don't think we succeed in that yet. And we're more um, an institution for historical research. Uh, we are an advisory organ for... Uh, uh, archaeological digging and um, well, build, rebuilding your monuments, um, in monumental houses. But we don't really seem to be able to engage with the public and create that community identity. And I think 
education is quite a large part of that. So you know, it's up to me to, uh, to do that. Well, education at Heritage Leiden. The most important thing that I, I think is, is what you really need to do um, is that you let people learn by doing their own research. And not just by uh, answering questions that we have uh, made before, but by um, creating their own questions and their answers, uh, finding the answers for those questions. And well, we have archaeological finds as well, so we use not just our archives, but also the archaeological finds, and we really like to use authentic materials. So this is a real 14th century uh, it's, uh, uh, a pot pee, pee, to pee in, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and using those primary sources, uh, using authentic sources, the real thing, is what we do at CSI Leiden as well. So I'll um, come back to that later. Just a few numbers. We get about 2,500 primary school students from six-year-old to 12-year-old, and only 500 secondary school students a year. So those primary schools, uh, they, they know how to find us. We have four different pro educational programs, and they know how to find us. But the secondary schools, it's... Um, well, it's just, it's hard. It's hard to reach them because it depends on the teachers and they don't have much time. Um, so I thought, what can I do to, to make that more, more real and well, to keep them? Um, at first, I, I just, um, well, I developed things, educational programs, while talking to the teachers, asking them what I wanted. Um, but every teacher wants something else. So I decided to go a bit farther up and have a look at what exactly is the purpose of history education in the Netherlands. What do we want children to learn? And well, I think all over the world there, have been, uh, there has been quite some discussion about that. Do we want people to, uh, well, be able to create, to identify with the same history? Do we want to create communities? Um, do we want them um, to, to, well, to, to have the same stories to, to, to know and to um, identify with? Do we want to, well, them to do historical research like academics do? Um, and actually, the last one, citizenship, I think has to do with both of them, uh, combining those. History at secondary schools, um, it has changed a lot in the last couple of, couple of years. In the year 2000, there were created 10 time periods, um, from hunters and farmers to uh, television and computer. And actually, students were not supposed to uh, know anything about people or uh, about um, events in those time periods. Just know something about the, the flow of time and greater, uh, well, how do you call them? Well, what, no, not really about, just about thinking. And um, actually, my co one of my colleagues asked, why did you put a guillotine uh, next to this? Don't, don't you like it? Um, and that's uh, one of the, the icons for the 18th century, which is called the time of wigs and revol revolutions. Um, and as I'm talking about 18th century manuscript uh, archival documents, uh, I thought it would be nice to put this next to it. Um, so in the, the, the um, time period, they lacked people and events. And to compensate for that, 
in 2009, we uh, got the historical canon with the 50 windows into the past. Past. It should be past somewhere uh, behind uh, the guillotine. Um, and those 50 windows are really about people and events and very small things. So those 50 windows have to be put into the 10 time period. And well, it, it's, it, it feels a bit strange, um, but well, that, that's the way it is. And recently um, we have switched to source based exams. So that, that's, uh, it's, it's quite a big change, and it, I think it's been 2015 that uh, students are just given sources they don't know anything about and have to place them in the context of the time period. Um, recently, more recently even, uh, an advisory report has been published on Education 2032, it has to do with um, students who enter education, uh, their secondary education in 2032. So that, that, that's all, they're starting now, or almost now. Um, and in that, um, history, history education will be part of a domain called people and society. Don't know much, much more specific about it yet because it's, there's, it's still being discussed, but um, one of the biggest things I got out of that is that the purpose of history education should be to create critical thinking citizens who can take an active role in democratic society. Wow, I thought, well, I can do something with that, I hope, while using archival documents. I'll go on for the sake of time. So, those... oh. I really liked this matrix, so I need it to put it in my presentation. It's, um, it's made by Peter Sixes, and he is a researcher of historical teaching. Uh, it shows the, well, actually, it's, it shows the red part is the, the emotional part of history, the, the narrative, the, the, actually, it's heritage. It's what, what you well, can uh, relate to in, a, in an emotional way. And the blue part is more the academic uh, part. It's uh, doing research, uh, using documents to um, create, create a meaning and a history theory using your competences. And Peter Six has put that little purple band in, and I really love purple, so uh, we're going to try, I was going to try to do my uh, educational project in, the, in that purple band. Like, you had to use the narrative and do research. Well, now we come to the fun part. The allure of the Leiden Judicial Archives. I hadn't read Arlette Farge's book yet, but and if you haven't read it, you should. You really should. Bec um, when I read it, I thought, yes, that's it. The Leiden Judicial Archives from the 18th century, well, they're, they're huge, but um, I only used the confession books and uh, the verdicts. These are the confession books, and they don't just smell good, they look good. They <laughs> I think there was a presentation on the, the smell of archives as well. I didn't attend it. But the, the good thing I, of the judicial archives is that they're about real people, not about uh, kings or politics or economics. They're just about very normal people. Um, and, well, I took one out here. Um, it's... Uh, about uh, Mariti Martijn. It's uh, the, the confession, and the confession is uh, actually built out of two things. It's the question that was posed and the answer that was given. This is the answer to who are you. Uh, she says she's called Mariti Martijn. She's 23 years old, born and living in Leiden, and a doubler. That's someone who makes a lining in coats and things. 
by trade. So this is, this is a real, real person. The second thing that's quite important, these archives are very readable. Even students can read them without knowing any paleography or uh, without doing, well, having to work too hard. Um, well, the answer was whether she, on Tuesday morning, the 22nd of December, 7051, you see, uh, uh, if you really uh, paid attention with the film, you know I made a mistake by transcribing the, fi transcribing the film. Uh, hasn't been in a certain coffee store. Sorry, I'm from Amsterdam. I just write coffee shop. Um, in the clock, clock stage, the clock alley. And she says, yes. I thought I don't need to <laughs> translate her answer. Another point that I think is very attractive about the archives is they are about places. Places and details, they create a vivid narrative. You know where she was, when, with whom, and what she did. So um, this is the center of, uh, of Leiden. And that's uh, map in the 18th century. Well, what did she do? Well, she was in a near coffee shop at the Klokstege, and she steals a pair of slippers. Ah. After that, she goes to the house opposite and steals some cotton. So, well, this is a very small confession, a very small uh, criminal, actually. But we have bigger ones as well. Um, what I really like, I didn't know, actually, when I started this project, is that we had digitized all the confessions and all the verdicts. So, well... We can use them on the website as well. So I, I really like the judicial archives and I've done quite a lot with them since I um, discovered them. Um, so I tried some uh, different educational approaches and one of them was an exam exa assignment for four students. Uh, I found a very difficult case with lots of testimonies and conflicting testimonies. And I, I myself didn't really have time to figure everything out and do the research. So I thought, oh, four students, um, they were 17 years old, you can do it. There, you have all the information, uh, all the documents, go on, go transcribing, ask me if you need any help. Um, and, well, they didn't fill their exams to um, be exactly, but the project was a failure because it was too much. Too much of documents and they just, uh, well, they, 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 they couldn't cope with, with that much information. So I thought, okay, I need smaller, smaller uh, criminals, smaller cases, not too long an interrogation. Um, and then I was actually um, contacted by a school and they wanted to do a project. I thought, no, I don't like that. It's too old and you know, I don't think children will learn everything, anything from it. So I convinced the teacher to do a CSI project with the judicial archives. Oh, I have to go on. Um, they had to write a newspaper article uh, about the, the crime. But um, actually the problem was they just visited it us once. I gave them their uh, confession and then they left for school. And I didn't have any contact with the students or the teacher. Uh, and I never saw anything uh, of any results. So I don't think it uh, was a success. Um, then actually a program, a project, which wasn't really education, but which was a success. So uh, I'll share it anyway. It was who killed Leuntje Bol. Uh, uh, we had a case of uh, a murder, a murdered girl of 19, and a lot of women being robbed in the streets in the years after. And it took all those years to find uh, the killer. Um, 
And actually, it, the killer was found by um, a city guard who put on a dress. So it, I uh, turned that, uh, that case into a murder mystery play for our museum night. It was a play of about 10 minutes. And I put all the, um, all, all the documents uh, in print next to the next to the play, so people could uh, say who done it. And it was a huge, huge success. Much better than the educational projects I worked with before. So then I thought, well, I, I learned a lot about it. What can I do to make this work? Because those, those archival resources, the judicial archives, are really a treasure. So I wanted to do something with them. And um, well, I've had about uh, three classes, not very many, but uh, it worked. So I'll tell you what we did. Uh, actually, they got a little card with the name of the, uh, of the criminal, and I went into the repository with my colleague to get the good, the right volume with the confession. They transcribed the confession, and after that, they fill in a table uh, who where, what, when, and they go to the crime scene, um, the location in the city, which usually is the crime scene, to make a movie with their smartphone um, in which they reenact or tell about the crime, and they are supposed to think about what, what would be the verdict. Um, and I really want to, them to reflect as well on the difference between then and now in social and judicial uh, ways. So, what do we get then? Then we get the <coughs> film. Just watch it again and now you'll know why well, I'm so happy about it. Can we play the film, please? <laughs> U weet dat hier een hele zware straf tegenover staat. U zou me ophangen. Nee! Dat dachten ze wel even. Stelen is in deze tijd zwaar verboden en daarmee uit. Well, obviously, those students knew you won't be hanged for stealing a pair of slippers and some cotton. Um, and we talked about it uh, afterwards. We uh, viewed all the films and talked about uh, the crime, the verdict, and I told them what the real verdict was. Uh, Mariti uh, was uh, flogged and banished for 12 years. So, not hanged. And we have a very diverse uh, set of crimes. So, I come to my conclusions. Um, this project enables students to work with authentic sources to, to have that historical experience. It zooms in on the individuals, while usually at school you get an economic and politic, uh, political um, well, history and not just individuals. What I think is very important, it connects to their smartphone-based life. Most of you are uh, holding your smartphones, and students are much worse. So you need to do something with that. Um, it stimulates their creativity, because they don't have slippers uh, or cotton, so they use their trainers and socks. Um, and, well, quite importantly, uh, it triggers them to think about social and judicial similarities and differences between the 18th century and now. Um, and 
for me, it connects the narrative, the highly narrative side of the judicial archives with that um, doing of historical research and uh, connecting those. Uh, I already said that. So I still have some dreams, of course. I would like to be able to have a fully web-based project as well. Um, this uh, project just takes three hours, so it, it's manageable for most schools. But if they're farther off, they have to ride their bicycle for a longer time and they won't be able to make it. So I want to be able to present it, uh, well, web-based as well, with an uploading module for movies. So we can uh, create uh, all those crimes and all those movies and have them together. But I think we should always keep the possibility of a visit because being in the repository and really touching uh, the volumes with the confessions in them is, well, it's an experience. Um, and I've had already some teachers from all over the Netherlands, well, the Netherlands aren't that big, but, um, all over the Netherlands wanting to do this project and I want them to be able to do that with their own archives if they are readable and accessible. So that's uh, what I would like to do as well. Well, if you have any questions, um, I think I should be go sit there. Yeah. And well, well, thanks Susan for that yeah. very much. <laughs> <laughs>